name is Erin Shaw. I'm a naturalist with Ohio Department of Natural Resources. On today's show, we're going to be talking about nature journaling. Nature journaling is important because it will help you become more aware of, of the outdoors. It will help you improve your observations through your sens sensory awareness. It will help you build longer lasting memories. It will help you uncover new ecological concepts and help you ask better questions when you're outside in the woods. It will help you appreciate nature and have a more meaningful experience. So today on our show, we have Lynn Johnson with us. Um, Lynn has been on the show before. He's OCVN. Lynn does keep a nature journal. So Lynn, thank you for being on the show today. Glad to be here, Aaron. <laughs> so today we're gonna move through the three different eras of nature journaling. We're gonna talk about ancient methods. We're gonna talk about traditional methods. And we're gonna talk about modern day methods. And we're with a focus on traditional methods. So by the end of this show, we hope to inspire you to keep a nature journal. And if you keep one already, we hope that you uh, learn or try out different techniques that might help you expand your nature journaling experience. So, so Lynn, um, can you explain why nature journaling is important? Like why it's been used throughout time? Well, nature journaling is important uh, because it does two things. One, uh, it allows people to keep a record of what they've observed, what they've noticed, what they've felt, what they've seen. Uh, and also, uh, it allows them then to use that information in the future. Uh, because when you think about it, particularly in the ancient era, everybody had to be a naturalist. They were dependent on the things that were around them in nature for their survival. They had to find food. Uh, that meant hunting animals. That meant finding edible plants. Uh, and if you don't know when a particular plant's going to have fruit on it, you can waste a lot of time chasing around a blackberry bush in December when there's no berries on it. Uh, that doesn't get you any food. So. Until about 100 years ago, everybody was a naturalist of some sort or other. Uh, you know, every farmer is a naturalist. So this really was something that they had to find ways of doing. Obviously, one of the things that almost certainly happened was oral traditions. Uh, the elders in the tribe or clan would pass along their knowledge to the younger people. Um, we're pretty sure they didn't leave YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, but. Um, and many of the ancient peoples did not have uh, paper and ink and, and writing that we uh, think of today when we think of journaling. So they had to have other ways of keeping their records. Okay, so when we're talking about ancient people, we're talking about uh, like cave writings and ancient Egyptians and... Absolutely, uh, the people like that, we can, we can think of ancients as anybody that didn't leave something written down for us to read uh, in, in, as kind of a broad definition of where that is. Um, and the, the best local example of that perhaps is the Hopewell people that built uh, what's now known as Fort Ancient, uh, just here a few miles away from where we're sitting in the studio right now. Uh, they were here about 2,000 years ago they lived mostly by hunting and gathering, but they did start to do some agriculture. They had some plants, and in fact, here's a little brochure that came from the um, Fort Ancient site uh, where they have a re reproduced a garden with a lot of the plants that were uh, believed to have been used by those people. And the, w the way they figured out how some of those were is the archeologists find remnants of seeds or pollen uh, and the middens, which are the trash dumps. Uh, archaeologists love trash. <laughs> and some of the kinds of plants that they uh, had in that garden, um, and I'm sure you can't read it in this brochure, but there were plants, most of which we don't do anything with today, but they were plants that had seeds that they could use for food, or fruits that they could use for food, or roots that they could use for food, uh, and found ways of making things uh, work. Now, how did they keep the records? we really don't know. 
Um, there's no evidence that they had paper uh, or other things to write on or that they knew about writing. Uh, their pottery has some decoration on it, but it's generally not considered to be writing as the clay tablets found in Mesopotamia or things like that were uh, roughly comparable time frames. Uh, so the, uh, but we do know that they had to have kept records because you, you aren't going to domesticate plants and start growing them if you aren't keeping records that, oh, hey, you put this little seed in the ground and next year or, or the, later this summer, a, a plant will pop up and, and later then we can eat the benefits from that. Well, and some of the plants are, are seasonal as far as when they're edible. So pulk, right. pulk, for example, you can eat it when it's young, but if you eat it too late, then it's, it can be toxic. So keeping track of the seasons, just even short term like that would be important if you're finding food out in the wild. Absolutely. And um, so Fort Ancient has a series of mounds and, and earthen works. Yes. Uh, Fort Ancient is considered to be the largest hilltop enclosure uh, in North America. Uh, the, the earthwork, which are basically earthen walls that are kind of triangular shaped, uh, that run around the irregular perimeter of the, of the area. They're over three miles long. Uh, most of them are two to three feet high, some of them as high as 20 to 30 feet. And they were built over a period of several hundred years. Uh, we don't build projects that take several hundred years anymore. And they were mostly built with hand tools and baskets of dirt. Uh, uh, again, we don't know exactly what that was for, but because there are known astronomical alignments where a mound here and a notch over there in the wall line up with the sun, sunrise on the summer solstice and, and a different mound and a different notch line up with the summer or the winter solstice sunrise. So we know that they were using this very large, very elaborate um, construction project, civil engineering project, as a calendar. Uh, we presume that they were using it for ceremonial purposes and perhaps also for agricultural purposes, knowing when to plant and things like that. Um, again, these are presumptions or guesses that the uh, archaeologists make because we don't have any definitive records of those things. Very good. That's interesting and something very local, a, a yes. good example. And like we mentioned, other examples would be the, the Great Pyramids and, and um, you mentioned the tablets. You know. Yes. Uh, the Mesopotamia, they found numerous clay tablets that had sort of pictograph type uh, images uh, pressed into the clay when the clay was soft and then after the clay hardened it became a permanent record, permanent well, long enough that some of them have lasted thousands of years. Uh, uh, a little bit later uh, a form of writing called cuneiform appeared which actually just used little triangular marks that are not quite letters but they're certainly not pictographs. Uh, and they were a little more abstract form of writing. Those were probably the earliest known forms of writing, and it's believed that those were typically used for keeping records of um, commercial transactions, business transactions, um, the things you needed to do to keep a, a uh, society running. Yeah, all right, so anything more before we move on to more traditional methods? Uh, I think that probably covers, uh, certainly there were many other things, as you mentioned, the cave paintings and things like that. Uh, I think maybe that one's worth mentioning just a little bit more. Some of the cave paintings appear to depict uh, animals that we don't have anymore. So by looking at those drawings and looking at the dates that, that the caves were occupied by humans of some sort, we can estimate when those animals may have gone extinct, um, but also it's believed that some of those may have shown techniques for hunting the animals. Uh, some of them appear to show spears or, or things like that and there, so that they may actually have been, you know, educational uh, images as well as uh, somebody's record of what happened. Yeah, so by studying the past is how we study the future, basically. Right. 
everything that we know happened in the past. I mean, you know, yes, we're experiencing what's going on right at this moment, but uh, if we don't remember what happened in the past and have some way of keeping track of that, then we're just going to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. That's right. So uh, moving on to more traditional methods. So now we're um, jumping ahead in history, say, to uh, Darwin kept a very important nature journal, and, and uh, Lewis and Clark is another right. example. Yes. Uh, after you mentioned doing this program, I did a little research into Lewis and Clark. Uh, their journey west started in 1804, and they specifically were instructed as part of that trip to find out what kinds of plants and animals existed in the western part of North America. Uh, they were looking for a route to the Pacific, uh, preferably by water so that they could get there easily. Uh, they didn't know there was a mountain range in the way. <laughs> uh, they found out before they got there. Uh, but they were specifically in instructed to keep records and I pulled up a uh, page, their, their journals are available um, electronically and I've grabbed, I've got the wrong page showing here. I was going to read you a section of that and I'm drawing, okay, here we go. Uh, if I may, just quickly read a section of one of the pages that talked about uh, some of the things they were seeing. Uh, it said, I walked on a shore, with, and this was, um, I think this was Clark uh, that wrote this particular section. Walked on a shore with a view to find an old volcano, said to be in this neighborhood by a Mr. J. Mackey of St. Charles. I walked ashore the whole day without seeing any appearances of the volcano. In my walk, I killed a buck goat. Uh, and the editor inserted the word antelope there. Uh, at this country, about the height of a grown deer, its body shorter, the horns, which is not very hard, and forks two-thirds up, and one prong short, and the other one round and sharp arched, and it is immediately above its eyes, and the color is a light gray with black behind its ears and down its neck, and white face round its neck its sides and its rump round its tail, which is short and white, very actively made, has only a pair of hoofs to each foot, his brains on the back of his head, his nostrils large, his eyes like sheep. He is more like an antelope or a gazella of Africa than any other species of goat. He was referring to what we now call the pronghorn. But throughout the several hundred pages of journals that Lewis and Clark kept on their journey are many references like this to animals that had never been seen uh, by the European settlers uh, that were spreading across North America at that time. Very good. That's interesting. And um, so I think today <laughs> I'm, I get tired of being on the computer all day, so I've taken an interest in in writing um, like they would have back then. So here I have a calligraphy pen and they would make their own ink. Uh, Aaron, what does calligraphy mean? Calligraphy is a style of writing and depending on what era or what place you are at, they have different styles. So I also got a, a calligraphy book and uh, which I have found very interesting. So uh, this is what I do in my free time at home for fun. I, I write different styles. I'm, I'm not very good at it, but um, it's a lot of fun and it has uh, inspired me to study people like Lewis and Clark and, and the way that they wrote and the way that they made ink and you know what else, is that as I've been studying this style of, of writing, is that um, through the past, this writing has become important even in wars because they would use disappearing ink in their messages. So they would have a written letter, you know, and the messenger goes, delivers it, 
and then the people, it looks like just a regular letter, and then if you hold it over a flame, you have a message that appears underneath. So I, it's just fascinating. And there's, there's different styles. We'll, we'll talk more about that here later. But uh, so with Lewis and Clark, they, they would make their own ink along the way. And I found this uh, with my dad's stuff, so it was pretty special. And it's ink that he made. It's basically from a candle. It, you know, if you put the glass lid on the top of the candle or on your oil oil lamp, um, there is the, the black carbon that collects. And then you can put a little bit of water or oil in there, mix it together, and there you have ink. Okay, yeah. Uh, ink basically requires a couple of things. It, it requires something, a pigment, in this case the, the black soot, um, and it also requires a vehicle to move that from the inkwell to the paper, and, and that is the liquid that it's, in, uh, that it's uh, dissolved in. And then that liquid has to evaporate, leaving the pigment behind. So ink is a very interesting process. It really is. So while we're talking about ink, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you my pen again. This um, is what they would have used in traditional uh, ways of writing, the Constitution, for example. And it has different, these tips are called nibs. And there's different um, style nibs. So depending on what style uh, calligraphy you're using, you can change, see this will come off like that. And then you can switch it out, like say I'm going to use, sorry, this type. So you just slide it in there like that, and that will give you a different style. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a different shape. And the way that you press it down, the way that you maneuver it on the paper will give you uh, either thin lines or thick lines. So. I've been watching YouTube videos and, and reading books and studying the different styles and trying it for myself. Um, another thing that they would have used possibly is, is a glass pen. So again, this is something I found in my dad's stuff, so it was special to me. This glass pen um, is something that you would dip in the inkwell and this is something fun to try if you're at home uh, with your kids or, or bored and tired of being on the computer. <laughs> you can, uh, it's actually really neat. It, if you're writing cards to someone, a thank you card or whatever, get well card, it looks very different than a regular ink pen. And it's fun. So this, uh, unless I was doing my nature journal at home, is probably not very practical today, you know, to take outside because it can be a bit messy, but it's fun. And uh, I don't know, has inspired me to start writing again. So, so did, did Lewis and Clark have steel nibs on their pens? I don't think so. I think they had a, like a piece of grass, basically, or a reed, and they would dip it into their ink. Or they could have used quill feathers. Yes, yes, of course. So. Um, Both of which were readily available along their route. Right. Whereas a steel nib would have been very hard for them to acquire if they bent one, dropped it, or lost it, or something like that. Yes, and um, they do bend easy, so you have to be careful with them. And I guess while we're talking about different styles of, of writing utensils here, um, this is another thing you might try. This is called a fountain pen. And again, this one has different, uh, different types of nibs on there. And so you can change out, sorry, <laughs> you can change out the, the tip of the pen for different styles. And you don't have to dip this one, but it does come apart. And then you would take this part and you dip it into this ink well, okay? And so you, you suck the ink up into it 
So it is liquid ink, but you don't have to keep dipping along the way. And fountain pens are also traditional, and you can write fancy calligraphy, you know, thick lines, thin lines, and there's a whole bunch of different styles. I'm learning as I go, you know, I bought one, I'm like, oh, that's not what I thought it was. So I've got two different kind of fountain pens now, but they're a lot of fun. Oh, this one's really fancy. This one, this one is my uh, Picasso, my Picasso pen. And so it, it's a nice one. It has a gold tip on it. And uh, the tip is nice because it bends easy and it just writes really nice. So something fun to try, especially if you're, if you're nature journaling or, you know, if you like writing. Okay, and then just to extend that a little farther, since today people tend to use either felt tip or ballpoint pens, uh, we should point out that uh, when astronauts first started going into space, there was considerable effort in, put uh, into figuring out what kind of pens would write in the microgravity environment of space. And they've created special ballpoint pens that have pressurized ink so that it will keep pushing the ink because the ink doesn't flow downward yeah. to the point, uh, they had to find other ways of making that work. But even astronauts have to write things down. <laughs> Very interesting. Yes. So um, if I'm at home, you know, and I have my table set up, uh, I will write with, with these utensils. But if I'm out in the field, I usually use a pencil just for simplicity's sake. Um, but... Anyway, let's keep moving. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to come back to traditional methods uh, my, because we want to inspire you, if you do keep a nature journal, on um, new techniques. Uh, and if you don't keep a nature journal, we're going to talk about how to start one and more on why it's important. But We've covered the basics. Now we're going to move on to moder or modern day, okay. and then we'll come back to the written part. But modern day, what I'm meaning by that is uh, technology. So most people these days, except for Lynn, <laughs> right, has a, an iPhone of some sort. And on this iPhone, I can put different apps and so forth on my phone. Um, so one of the apps I have is called iNaturalist, and it's something I can use out in the field. It is like nature journaling. I can take a picture of whatever plant I'm looking at. It will give me a few ideas of what, what kind of uh, plant it might be, and then it will pull up a web page, you know, like uses and the history and you know description all sorts of things and there's projects within the app that are helpful to parks or states or research in general because for example right now we're in wildflower season so um, ODNR does a wildflower report and this is something you can use iNaturalist for because while you're out, you can say, oh, I've, today I found a, a harbinger of spring, and you take a picture of it, and you send it into, this, into the project, which is in the app already. And then other people can see what's blooming at this time and where it's blooming. And if you take that one step further, you can start to study the seasons or weather patterns or, you know, why does this plant bloom first here? Is it elevation? Is it the, the way the sun is, is hitting it? I don't know. You know, what kind of animals are coming to this spot? And there's just many layers of, of uh, information or exploration you can do with that. So I know that you have a couple. Yeah, I've, well, I've used iNaturalist, even though I don't have a smartphone. Uh, they, they do have a method that people like me uh, can take pictures with a uh, digital camera and then go back home and upload them from their computer to the uh, website so you don't get the instant feedback while you're out in the field with that um, but I do use it that way uh, and the, these projects that Aaron mentioned are also used um, 
for other purposes. For example, at Fort Ancient, the project down there is attempting to catalog all of the different kinds of things that live in the uh, nature preserve area of Fort Ancient. Um, because of the COVID pandemic, the project got off to a very slow start and not much has happened yet, but, but they are actually using that not just to say, oh, what's blooming today, but, but more broadly, what actually lives here. Right, and so there's a lot of other ones too, like eBird and just a whole slew of, of apps available. And there's tutorials. So if you're not familiar with iNaturalist or um, did you kind of Project Feeder Watch, is that what you said? Yes, Project Feeder Watch is a project put together by um, uh, the Cornell University Ornithology Laboratory. Ornithology is a big word that means studying birds. Uh, and they have a, a procedure set up for where you can sit at home, watch the birds coming to your bird feeder, and report it uh, through an online connection to Cornell. And they have people all over the world doing this, uh, mostly through the winter time, but they're now kind of extending it on into the summer as well. And this allows them to accumulate a lot of data um, that they could never possibly, that the scientists at or Cornell could never possibly do on their own. They just don't have enough people, enough money, and so forth, enough time to do these things. But if you or I or Aaron sits down and spends an hour or two looking at our bird feeders, and Aaron can pretend like she's working while she does that at her office because she can look right out to the bird feeders there. Um, and, and, and at home, I do the same thing. I look out of my kitchen window, and there's the, there's the bird feeders out there. Uh, but by reporting that, they can find out is this species increasing? Is that species decreasing? Are they migrating earlier or later? Uh, do they migrate when there's snow on the ground or, or do they wait until the weather's warmer? Uh, all kinds of things like that. This is called citizen science. Uh, the citizen doesn't necessarily have to be a scientist to make this work. They just have to be able to make an observation and report it and then the scientists analyze it. So, this is another way that the, a form of nature journaling, and it's one that can really make you feel kind of good that you're contributing not just to your own benefit, but to the benefit of the environment, various species, the, the overall knowledge that we have of what's going on around us. Yeah, that is neat. And it's easy to do. I, yes. You know, for me on, on iNaturalist, and like, you can send in your uh, findings either locally to one park or, you know, globally. You can pick which project you're uploading to, but you simply take a picture, upload it, and then the data is put together for you. And you can go back through previous years and look at patterns. So it is fascinating. Yeah. And, and, they, and there are scientists that spend their time studying iNaturalist data. Yeah, we use it. We use it for the wildflower mm. report, yeah. so. Um, just, again, examples. Anything else about, we're gonna call that modern day before we go back? I think that uh, you know, gives them a highlight of what's there, so. Yeah, okay. Um, so, using your apps is great. We're gonna go back to more traditional methods, per se, which is using a, a book that you take outside with you or you, you bring your ideas back to your home and then you write them in your book, in your nature journal. So for me, this is um, a more, mm, for me personally, because by writing something, it helps me process information on a deeper level. It helps me remember things on a deeper level. It's more of a connection. It's more of a personal thing, I suppose. I think you're right there and I think that there are studies by psychologists and educators and so on that say that people learn things better if they work it through several different processes. You may observe something with your eyes or hear it with your ears, but then when you go write it down, you're doing something physical, uh, plus reinforcing the memory, plus rewording it in a format that fits on a piece of paper. All of those things help reinforce the memories. Uh, um, and I find that 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 works for me, uh, that 
I usually end up writing things in my journal after the fact rather than taking it out in the woods, although there are times when I do take journals with me when I'm going out somewhere. But typically I come back at the end of the day and, and, and write something down. Uh, but then I find that if I go back later and look at it, the things that I've written down are the things that I probably recalled when I said, oh, what, what was it that happened a while back? And I go back and say, did I write that down? Yes, I did write that down. And, and, and I often remember it the way it was written down or very similar to that. Yes. So there's many different ways or, or techniques you can use for nature journaling. And um, so for a broad uh, category, we have field journaling, which is basically taking your journal out in the field with you. And you can say, uh, maybe you sit down by this flower. And in your journal, you're going to write the date, the weather, the, the condition, the location of where you are. And you might draw a, a picture of this flower. And keep in mind, it doesn't have to be a, a work of art. This is, <laughs> this is not product. This is process. Because by drawing this flower, it helps you see details on a deeper level than you would if you just simply took a picture of it. Or you saw it and you said, oh, that's nice. But if you draw it, especially if you look at it, you close your eyes and you have to picture it in your mind before you draw it. You know, you're really, really, really observing this on a, on a much deeper level. Um, so that would be field journaling. And you, do, and you do that a lot with butterflies, right? Oh, right. Because <laughs> they fly away before you get the picture drawn. <laughs> That's right. You have to do that one by memory for sure. Um, so another one would be memory journaling. And for me, this is, I'm going to challenge myself to do more of the, the field journaling where I'm actually out writing stuff because I, I have a, I'm very aware of how the seasons are changing in the recent, like, past 10 years or all of my life, really. I've been paying attention to how the stars move. I've seen examples. I've watched videos on TV, you know, I, I understand how the earth rotates and how everything moves around, but just in the last year have I really, really been able to put this together, like where the North Star is and, and how the sun moves. I'm noticing right now, as we're coming up to the equinox, how the shadows are changing, you know, and how the sun is changing directions. So. Um, I keep that in my mind as a mental thing, but I don't always write it down. Um, but I, I pay attention to things like, when do I see the first lightning bug? And it's usually mid-May. Mm -hmm. And I pay attention to uh, what sounds am I hearing as the season progresses. So, um, I don't know, it's just a different... Yeah, yeah the, in, my, in my notebook here, uh, and this is just a... Actually, it was an old book. You can see the corners torn off here. So something had torn up that corner, but nobody had ever used the book. So I started saying, I want to write down some of my naturalist observations. And so on the first page here, I said, okay, I'm just going to start writing the first time I see things this year. What date did I first see uh, a flower blooming? Uh, well, the first flower I saw blooming this year, I didn't write down because I didn't start this till after that. It was a dandelion, I think, in, on January 2nd or something like that. Uh, but I went down through here, and I just have one line, what date, what was it I saw, um, and maybe where I saw it. Um, you know, I saw a red-shouldered hawk flying in front overhead of my house uh, on 15th of February. Uh, last week we saw a loon, a common loon, out at the uh, um, uh, boat ramp. Uh, and I've been writing things like that down. I haven't been doing this for many years. I just basically started this this year. Uh, so it's not going to give me a lot of records, but it, but it is something that says, this helps force me to pay attention to what's going on every day. Mm -hmm. And some of the things are very common things. Like yesterday, I saw a chipmunk. 
Well, chipmunk's not an unusual thing. It's something you see every year, but they do hibernate. Uh, and so yesterday was the first time I saw one out and running around. Uh, so I made a note of that. Uh, and that helps, you be, helps me be aware of the ordinary things that are around, that they're just as important and just as special in many cases as something exotic or rare. Um, so I think that's one of the real values of doing this kind of journaling. And there's, there's no real rules. You can kind of do what, especially on the personal journaling, you can do what works for you. And it may vary over time. Some days you'll do this kind of stuff. Other days you might write a big essay on how you felt about something that day. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, my background is a school teacher, and she's going to grade my paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me get my red ink here. I have some. <laughs> um, and there's uh, multiple intelligences, is what they called it when I was studying, um, which basically means there's different ways of thinking about things. So you have your visual, spatial ways of thinking, um, uh, which would be like maps and architecture. There's linguistic verbal, so that's your oral language, your written language. Uh, you have your logical, mathematical, uh, so calculations and solving abstract problems. Bodily kinesthetics. So that's your mind and your body working together. And your musical, interpersonal, which is recognizing other people's moods and motivations and intentions, or intra, intrapersonal, recognizing your own moods, and then nat naturalistic. So as you're writing in your nature journal, I would challenge you to, to write these different intelligences, different ways of thinking, maybe on the front page or on the back page of your journal, and then try integrating those in into your, into your writings. So for visual or spatial, you know, try, try one day drawing a map and using that part of your, your thinking process. And pay attention to the map, you know, what, what is happening at this elevation or, you know, how the forest works together. The tree is here, but the whole forest is here, and how does that fit together? Um, or you could practice your, your linguistic verbal by writing a poem or a haiku or something, you know. So you're, you basically you're, you're um, using different thought processes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that can be very helpful, especially the idea about different thought processes, uh, different ways of thinking about things really change your perspective on what's going on. I've been taking some uh, meditation classes uh, for the past couple of years, and a lot of the emphasis has been on what is known as mindfulness. And I find that that immediately transfers over into other things that I'm doing. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was out running through a park, uh, and as I was running along, coming up a hill through uh, a winding area through a little uh, forest, all of a sudden I found myself, and it was a bright sunny day, so I had a visor on, so I wasn't getting the sun right in my, kind of like these lights here in the studio. Uh, but I was like, I was, so I had my head down a little bit, I was going up a hill, and so all I could see in front of me was the trunks of the trees, and all of a sudden it was like red cedar tree, um, you know, maple tree, and I'm not an expert in trees, uh, but all of a sudden that's what was part coming into my awareness was these various kinds of trees that were on the side of this hill in this park. And it, it was just like, wow, this opportunity to be aware of what's going on makes me see this forest. And I wasn't out there on a nature hike, I was out there to go for a run, but all of a sudden I, was, I wasn't just running, I wasn't you know, trying to keep the sun out of my eyes, all of a sudden I was appreciating this little forest around me. And it's written down in my book uh, because it made an impression on me. Uh, and that was one that, it fit several of those things, the kinesthetic, the visual, 
you know, awareness, a whole bunch of things were going on there at the same time. Yeah, so if you're observing, say, a variety of trees and then you come up to a spot where it's just cedar trees, so why is it just cedar trees? There's something different there. Yeah. It could be the elevation, it could be the soil type. And then, so if you understand the soil type, would this be a good type of soil for a house? Or would it be a good type of soil for, you know, whatever, to build the trail through here or not? And then, you know, just kind of bringing it all together right. is fascinating to me. And I, th I think it's important and has been important through history. So, um, let's see, other techniques that you might use would be, uh, like we said, sketching or trying different types of uh, language, describe your observation with words, and inventory, oh, observe patterns, and then supplement your observations with other research, with other people's journals, or, you know, just, so we're trying to expand or inspire you to, to try a nature journal and then to try different, different ways to open your observation and your, your awareness. So, I don't know, anything else, Lynn? I'm excited, I'm gonna- I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one more thing in okay. here real quickly. I found this book that just recently, it's called The World of Wonders. The author's name is Amy Nezhuku Mahatahil, or something like that. Uh, she actually has a local connection. She went to Beaver Creek High School. Um, she's not exactly a naturalist. Uh, her She's a poet or something, but her, her and her mother apparently was a uh, psychologist, but also was very interested in nature. But this little book called World of Wonders in Praise of Fireflies, Whale Sharks, and Other Astonishments. Uh, each little chapter is just a couple of pages long, but there's a chapter on fireflies. It's not about all about fireflies, but it's about the impressions that she had as a little girl growing up and seeing fireflies in the yard and things like that. So, so and I, when I read this a few weeks ago for the first time, I thought, this is an expanded version of, of nature journaling into a literary uh, event. Um, and, you know, there's about 20 chapters in here, each one referring to a different plant or animal. Um, but it's also about her relationship with that animal, her reactions to that animal, and so forth. So I think that this kind of journaling, this is a different kind of journaling, but it still, I think, fits into the category of journaling. And this allows you to look at what somebody else sees, experiences, feels from these kinds of things. And I'm finding that it's very, enjoyable to read these things. Her perspective is very different from what mine would be, but I learned something from seeing how other people think about this stuff as well, so. That's good, so that one would be a, a journal that kind of focus, it's more of a story type thing. That's right. And then, so if you're traveling, say you're gonna go on vacation, maybe you have a separate journal for your travels and maybe you have a separate journal for, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have journals. <laughs> so. Sorry, I didn't give him time to get oh. that on the picture there, but I, I have more than one journal with slightly different emphasis. Yes, that's great. And um, you could use like plain, just plain white paper so that you're, you're drawing pictures. This is a, a special type of paper. If you're going to try the, the dip, ink, you know, that it's important to use the right kind of paper so that it doesn't go through. Um, your journal might be a, a graph paper of sorts that will help you draw pictures or sketches and become more accurate, or maybe it will help your, your writing be better. Um, you could use a little one that you can carry in your pocket out with you. So. There's, there's so many different uh, opportunities, I suppose. And 
while I have my stuff here, this these are called uh, well, it's like hand lettering, and my handwriting is not fantastic, but I'm I'm trying and I'm interested. So with with hand lettering, there's different types of of pins. Um, it's more of like a brush strokes, different styles. I don't know. It's just fun and it inspires me to, to write and draw different things, to think different ways, I suppose. Yeah, I learned to do some lettering when I was in high school and college because I, I was training to be an engineer, even though I became an electrical engineer where that kind of drawing wasn't as important. Uh, there were requirements to learn how to do mechanical drawing and lettering is a specific part of that. There's a particular style of lettering that's used in, in drawings, although these days most drawings are done with computerized uh, software. And so the, I suspect the art of draw, lettering is going away from the engineering fields, but it was something that I learned a long time ago. And, and there are times when you want to be precise, you want to be careful about the marks you're making on the paper and lettering is a good way to learn to do that. Yeah, so um, we've covered a wide variety of, of uh, techniques and styles today. We've talked about ancient methods of nature journaling or keeping records. We've talked about traditional methods and we've talked about modern day methods with your, with your phone app and so forth. Um, journaling is important because it helps you become more aware. It helps you use different parts of your brain. It helps you expand and learn more about yourself and, and the world in general, you know, and how you fit in with that. Um, and how things are changing, like maybe the environment or ah, all sorts of things. It could help you with your career, like you said, if you're becoming an architect. Uh, keeping a nature journal will help you think and draw. So there's not a real right or wrong way to do it, but we do encourage you to try, and if you have one, to expand different techniques. And uh, so thank you very much, Lynn, for being on the show today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Aaron. And just a, a, a final comment, I would say that what we're really interested in is people getting out enjoying nature, appreciating it, learning a little bit about it, because the more you know about it, the more likely you are to appreciate it, to love it and protect it. And journaling is just one of the ways that helps you to reinforce those things, um, gives you an opportunity to learn things because you've got something written down. If you're not sure about it, then you can go look it up. Uh, but get out and enjoy it, and in particular, the next few weeks as we go through springtime here is one of the most spectacular times to be out in our woodlands uh, because this is when the spring wildflowers are blooming and they only bloom for a few weeks in the springtime and then they're gone. Yeah, so with that I would encourage you to to draw a map of where you are and take a journal entry of what the flower looks like before it opens, you know, sketch it before it blooms and then sketch it while it's in full bloom and then sketch it as it's going out. And ah, anyway, I'm excited. I, I'm gonna start mine. I, I have mine mentally right now, but I'm gonna start writing. I might use my fancy pens here <laughs> or maybe just my pencil if I'm out in the woods. But uh, thanks again, Lynn. And that's it for today's show. Thanks for watching. Um, if you would like more information, you can check us out on the web at ohiostateparks.org, or we'll see you at the Nature Center, and we hope to see you on the trails.